you know, I, I, I'll bet everybody in, in the room, and I'm sure everybody on this stage has spent a lot of time looking at, you know, lean kind of methodologies and, and so on. And, you know, the first thing that you, you discover when you do that is, you know, overlap is a really wasteful thing. You know, do something in one location. Don't retest or don't redo it, you know. And it seems to me that as the manufacturers in the channel could could kind of go to a joint Kaizen event and figure out what are we both doing? W would it make sense for you to do it and not us, or us and not you, or maybe you do the front, we do the back, but you know, map this thing out because I think there's just an awful lot of overlap and you know, maybe some of that just comes from uh, a little bit of lack of trust historically or some, something is driving that, but if we don't do that, I think the structural costs are just going to you know, remain too high and I think it'll seriously impede our ability to invest in getting these complex things to our customers in a, an effective way. Getting everybody to do it once instead of three people to do the same yeah, thing. Yeah, let's Kaizen our, our well, all, all, the, all the forces we talked about, they're going to be continued alignments and relationships. I mean, it's just, it has to happen. So we'll, I think uh, everybody in the market will start picking partners that they, that they think they can win with. And uh, that, I think those relationship shifts and alignments are going to continue. And, and that will enable those kinds of continued uh, you know, efficiencies to be built into the supply chain that, that Tom's talking about. It'd be it, more it, important to fewer people. It, it, I, I'm just kind of thinking back on my early life, back when I had a real job, and I, I did have a real job once in the time of the dinosaurs, but I came out of electronic component distribution, you know, with Intel and Signetics and TI and, and ran a company called Schwaber Electronics, and because of the pressure on the margin, the consolidation, what Tom described happened, where, where the manufacturer and distributor, the trade association was kind of the arbitrator, but, but they actually started to map things out. So instead of having this negotiation, it's who could perform the function most cost effectively. And, and the industry had much lower margins, gross margins, but had higher financial returns for both manufacturers and distributors by going through it. And it was the commercial pressure of the globalization, the, the the Japanese memory guys coming in, and it was and so it was all being forced. But but I'm thinking, I was at the time I was thinking that was horrible because I was like one of the guys Jane talks about that didn't like the innovation because once you figure it out, it's like don't mess with me. But it was a good thing. That's maybe that's not so scary to have happen here. And and I think the Cap Council is actually talking about those kinds of pro funding those kind of projects right now. So, so, what's the workforce going to look like? Ten years from now, I mean, are we all going to be young with, with Google Glasses and, and, I mean, are we still going to have salespeople calling on people? I mean, what's, a, what's your sense of what it's going to look like? Well, I think we're still going to have salespeople calling on customers. Uh, I think they're going to obviously have to be supplemented by, you know, as always, you need to have very strong inside technical staff to support them. Do I think that we're going to have much more online, both searching for products, determining product requirements and specifications, uh, and certainly transactions? Absolutely. But if we believe that continuing to add value to our customers is important, it's really hard to get all of that over the phone. I mean, some of it will, but how do you, how do you define a requirement for a new product if you haven't seen the application? That's what I struggle with. So I think that the way in which we transact business will change. Uh, but, and it will shift, but I see that there's some core fundamentals that need to remain in place, and we need to have really good people in those spots. Tom? Huh? Uh, did, did you say 10 years? It's kind of hard for me to predict what that's going to be like 10 well, years. Well, I mean, longer than Let's the say, next recession. Okay. <laughs> Well, I, I think our, I mean, maybe if I start at what's the customer going to look like and, and work, work back, I think, you know, the customer is going to probably act you know, very differently. I mean, it's a generation coming that doesn't pick up the phone, goes right to the Internet for information. Uh, and, and the speed that they do that at is, is alarming. You know, they text, they don't email. So if that's the customer of the future 10 years from now, uh, 
you know, it's, 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 there's going to be a lot more online services, training, but just, just uh, you know, positioning of the product is going to have to be done there because they may not take a, they may not take a, a call or they may not want to go to a meeting to learn something. I, I don't mean that in, in an ab absolute, absolute terms, but I think it's going to drift that way more, and I think we're going to have more people interacting via electronic means with customers answering questions and you know, configuring products or whatever it is and less person to person. So there'll still be salespeople, but I suspect the, the connected technology part of this is going to be unimaginably large 10 years from now compared to what it is, is today. It, but I'm hearing you say, very, in, in a sense, and maybe I'm connecting it too close, but it will change the fabric of how we do this, but we're still going to be still, you have to look at the new product requirements or how somebody's trying to install something. Yeah. So. Yeah, I was, uh, I'm sorry, I was just going to just add one other thing, which is um, the stuff is getting really com complicated, obviously. I, I was looking at a, li a lineup of switch gear uh, six months ago or so, and I realized that there is just an awful lot of software in a line of, uh, this lineup of switchgear. So I asked the question, how much software is in this lineup of switchgear? It was two million lines of code what? in switchgear. In uh, switchgear? Got meters, got communications. It's, so, it's so, something as simple as a lineup of switchgear is no longer simple. And 10 years from now, that's going to be even more true. You can fly a Boeing 777 with 2 million lines of code, so that's <laughs> what it tells you. Maybe we're just bad at writing code, but, but even so, it's a lot. What's your, what's your sense, Chris, of what will stay or what will be different? Well, I, well, I clearly agree with all the bill. I think we'll, be, we'll have a highly trained workforce, and I think that, the, that uh, we really have to move. To sort of put it in terms of where we are now, we, we've, fallen into, we've fallen into, I think distributors have fallen into this sort of branch-centric model because it was sort of, let's be proximate to our customers, let's put our inventory where our customers are. And if you look at all the changes with supply chain, delivery, transaction costs, and all that kind of stuff, I think you have to move from not the branch, branch in the center and the customers around it. I think if they move to the customer in the center and all the things that the customer needs around it, and that would be the way they want to communicate, where the product is, how quickly they need it. So uh, we're looking at models that really kind of take us out of this sort of branch thought to a customer center. And then all the elements we're talking about circle that customer. And then you can decide how you service the customer with either your salespeople or the tools that we've also brought up here. That's so, very different is, than what brung us to the day. Yeah, very much so. Uh, pro proximity it doesn't mean uh, physical proximity anymore, and so that's that's one. But another the proximity where he's talking, where, where Tom was talking about texting, that's proximity. Exactly. That's, that's what I mean. It's not it's not a geographic or a physical proximity any longer. So that's a, another way to maybe start thinking about it. I would offer. Well, I, I agree. I think uh, as our customers become more agile in the marketplace, we need to be able to respond with a similar agility, but also begin to think about how you can develop that virtual relationship uh, so that you're able to communicate and support your customer on all levels with the internet, with technology, with a phone call. Uh, I think relationships are still going to reign. It's just going to be a different kind of relationship. Yeah, that trust is absolutely critical because there's, you know, what's, what's the joke on TV now of the, the gal dating the French model? It's on the internet. It must be true. You know, being able to sort through what's real when it isn't because as you talk about the complexity that Neil was dealing with, there, you get any of this wrong, people die. I mean, we're still in a pretty core foundation industry. And in terms of our audience out there, if, if there's a message you want to give to a senior executive, they're thinking about the future of the channel and, and how they need to be thinking about this or moving forward, what, and you're going to just sort of boil it down. Remember City Slickers, Jack Palance and Billy Crystal and Norman the Cow, and Jack Palance kept going, the one thing. What's the one thing? Who wants to go first? I'll start. Okay. I, I would say um, uh, lead with innovation, service innovation. Uh, uh, inspire your people to think out of the box every day. Chris, how about you? I don't know if it's one, but I would tell you, expand and invest. Uh, expand your offering, expand your customer base, and invest in your people and technology. So expand and invest. Neil? 
I think the, the people side and the investment side is really it. Um, making sure that you can complete that link between the people in your customer, the people with your suppliers, and your people. Uh, that you invest to provide them the tools that they're gonna need for this inevitable transition uh, and invest in your business so you can not only help your customer but also get those transaction costs to asymptotically approach zero. Oh, big word. Tom, you get the last word. Uh, well, you know, 70% of all energy used in this planet is in of the form of electricity, and that's getting bigger. And I think that gap we talked about is going to grow. And it's just such a terrific time to be in the electrical industry. I think it's the best time that, that, that has ever existed. And I think together as a manufacturer and channel, you know, neither of us can seize that opportunity So We have to figure out how to do it together and do it in an effective way. And so I think at the same time, it has just never been a better time for us to realize we're in this together and we can get after it together. And if we do it, it's, it's going to be hugely rewarding for both. Outstanding. Please join me in thanking our panelists.